بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى I think everybody now appreciates hopefully to some extent the importance of a sensible career choice and how parents need to guide their children inside this and dini considerations just as we should give ethical considerations there should be dini considerations however you know happiness and contentment is not just limited to someone's profession job the means they've adopted to earn a livelihood it's not just limited to that for someone to be happy they need to have a happy family life as well they need to first and foremost make a choice such a choice of a spouse of a partner of a wife which will basically fulfill that part and that element of their life regarding this rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said and you might have heard this hadith many times that tunkahu almar'atu li arba'in a person marries usually for four reasons or one of four reasons either somebody gives priority to all four or somebody doesn't give priority to all four for him it's only one thing which is a priority li maliha wa li hasabiha wa li jamaliha wa li diniha some people choose wealth meaning the boy he sees a girl and she has wealth and will come to that so he gives that priority for him deen is not a priority li hasabiha somebody gives priority to status hasab it could refer to lineage you know in arabs lineage is very important even if you look at this country up to 100 years ago as recently as 100 years ago you know you know if you look at what we call the upper class they would only get married within certain circles they would not move out of those circles so hasab and then you've got jamal wali jamaliha the a person the only consideration he is giving is beauty that i want a spouse he goes to see a girl and immediately he falls what do we say in english head over heels in love with her he does not look at anything else her dini status etc and the last thing is deen so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there's four areas that are normally considered there could be other considerations as well but four things are generally considered in society what does rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam advise his ummah fadfar bi dhati ad-din that choose the one who has deen inside her does that mean that we are not going to look at beauty etc okay we'll come to that but down here in this hadith <coughs> rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam clearly highlighted there's different people with different priorities as a believer as a mu'min our priority must be deen so if there's a clash of priorities you go to see a girl she might not be from a high hasab okay and she doesn't have any um wealth and wealth should not be a consideration you're the breadwinner sharia has placed that obligation upon you and she's you know okay looking she's not the worst and she's not the best however she's got deen inside her you know she's fears allah she has the fear of allah inside her she has basic taqwa inside her she is a person who you know covers her satar properly when she is in public she knows how to conduct herself etc <coughs> our priority it should be deen it should be that deen that deen should be what propels us to propose to her nothing else basically if you look at beauty jamal i think most boys sitting here if you already married 
I'm sure the first thing you would have looked at when you went is Kiwilaget, basically. That's what you would have looked at, Jamal. And we'll come to Jamal in a second again, but what you've got to appreciate is if the girl is beautiful, Allah has given her beauty, she's got no deen inside her, no fear of Allah, no taqwa. What will happen is her Jamal will be her downfall. Have you not seen, you know, come on, we all live in the real world. None of us, you know, walks every day in the seven heavens. We all live on earth and we all live in Preston and walk and talk the streets of Preston. Do we not see when we, a, a beautiful girl, when she's got no deen inside her, what does she do? She basically displays and flaunts and her beauty. There's arrogance inside her. Is this the type of person you want to get married to? That you're constantly going to be basically under this mental pressure. That, Alhamdulillah, Allah has given me a beautiful wife. However, because she has no deen, I'm constantly looking over my shoulder. You all get the gist of what I'm trying to say, basically. So this is what happens when there is just Jamal, just beauty taken into consideration. No deen. Basically, no deen. Her Jamal basically becomes her downfall. And your downfall as well. You know, in Arabic, there is a saying, Al-ma'ul azb yakthurul waridun alayh. Al-ma'ul azb yakthurul waridun alayh. This is in line with what I just said, that if there's beauty and no fear of Allah, there's going to be arrogance. There's going to be display and flaunting of that beauty, inviting unwanted attention, a provocative attitude. And this Arabic saying fits with that. Al-ma'ul adb means sweet water. Now, you've got to take this Arabic saying in the context of the Arabian Peninsula, where there is, you know, water is scarce. Maybe nowadays things might have changed. We're talking about hundreds of years ago. Basically, water is scarce. It's a very precious commodity. And on top of that, if somebody finds or comes across al-ma'ul azb, you know, water which is mashallah sweet, it's nice, it tastes nice, what's going to happen? More people are going to come and utilize that water. Because, you know, first of all, it's a precious commodity. It's scarce. And on top of that, mashallah, this water is sweet. We can drink from it without any fear of illness, etc. So, yakthurul wariduna alayh. Just fit this in now with that girl who has got beauty and no deen, no taqwa, no fear of Allah. And on top of that, she flaunts her beauty, etc. Just fit that with that yourself. I'm sure you can read um, between the lines. Coming to the issue of beauty... Beauty is a consideration. You know, with deen, there's got to be you know, some sort of physical attraction. Nobody denies that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself stated to a sahabi, Anadharta ilayha? When a sahabi informed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or he saw this sahabi that he's got married, so he asked that, you know, before your nikah, Anadharta ilayha? Did you look at her? So can you see, there is consideration. Nobody denies that basically there's got to be some sort of physical attraction, uh, especially in the early part of the marriage, etc., before it gels, before it bonds further. There's got to be that physical attraction as well. And Rasulullah himself, he promoted it. But at the same time, when there is a clash, you've got to make sure deen is there as well. So you go to see a girl, alhamdulillah, you know, you feel that, yes, I can get married to this person. But before you say yes, you need to also judge the dini level of this person. That where does this person stand when it comes to deen? Because it's deen that will solidify and cement that nikah. No deen at some point, there will be problems. There will be problems. And in sharia, it is lawful for a person to go and see uh, a prospective partner, to physically see them basically with their eyes 
and look at her face. There is nothing wrong with that. Sharia has actually given that permission. So this again shows that there is consideration towards beauty, towards Jamal, but not at the expense of deen. That's what we've got to uh, appreciate. Then we've got hasab, you know, status, lineage. I think in our communities, maybe 30, 40 years ago, there was this, uh, what do you call it, maybe, I don't know, Surti Baruchi thing. The Surtis only got married in the Surtis and the Baruchis only got married in the Baruchis. I think that's long gone now. We've crossed many borders since that. Okay, we've co crossed continents. We've crossed cultures. So I think that's not applicable for us. But just a point on that, that if you look at the books of fiqh, it talks about kufu, kafa'a. You might have heard this word. Kafa'a means that there's got to be some sort of equality when it comes to social status, etc. Because if the social status of one person, meaning the girl, is higher, again, that can pose a problem for the boy later on. So there's got to be some sort of equality in kafa'a. But uh, this is something... Um, which, like I said, it's really not applicable in today's society, especially for Muslims um, looking in the, uh, living in the UK. Another thing, wealth. So beauty is an important issue. Okay? Let that not be the downfall, future downfall of your nikah. Don't just give that pri a, uh, priority and nothing else. Deen is given no consideration. Mal. Obviously, in those days... A woman, she might have had wealth through inheritance. Her father was wealthy. He's passed away. He's died. He's left his daughter considerable inheritance. So a person desires to marry such a girl who's got wealth because he feels that, you know, I to buy one, get one free, basically. So he doesn't look at deen, etc. All he looks at is the wealth. And if that wealth was to finish... Does that mean the nikah is going to finish as well? Is that going to mean that that's the end basically? So Rasulullah said, wealth should also not be your consideration. Now let's just turn this the other way around into today's society. A boy, he goes to see a girl and she's, mashallah, very highly qualified. She's got a very good career, a high earner, etc., and maybe she's earning far more, far more than this boy. The other thing to appreciate is, I mean, it's an undeniable fact that if you compare boys and girls, who is generally more hardworking and also clever as well, naturally clever? Come on, tell me. Girls, let's not deny that. I told that to the boys yesterday. They weren't happy. Okay, the Alim class boys, I told them. Okay, we had a bit of a discussion on this because they were asking me questions. So... Basically, yeah, you know, it's undeniable that well, if you've got 10 boys, five might be hardworking, makes effort, you know, academically might achieve something. If you've got 10 girls, it's probably 8 out of 10. 7 out of 10. The ratio is higher. That's what I mean. The ratio is far higher. So you've got these girls who've, mashallah, achieved what they've achieved. This boy goes to see this girl and... You know, everything seems to be there and she's a high earner and she earns far more than him, dwarfs his earnings. Again, if there's no deen inside this girl, this status of hers being a high earner, you know, being on the career ladder, etc., it will definitely prove problematic at some point. It will definitely prove problematic for this boy at some point in life. And inshallah, we're going to discuss this later on, um, maybe tomorrow or the day after. But I thought I'll just put this here, that this is again something that needs to be considered. That don't just be um, blinded by the fact that mashallah, oh, she works and she does this and she does that and she earns this much money, basically. The other thing is, girls usually don't want to get married to what type of boys who are earning less than them. And that's a fact. That's a fact, basically. They don't want to uh, uh, marry uh, someone who is earning less than them. So what are they looking at? They're looking also at mal. 
They're not looking at Dindari, that this person, he's, he, has, he might be earning less than me, but he has got Deen inside him. They're not looking at that. And I'll tell you the downfall of this. What's happening is these girls who I call overqualified, I don't call them greatly qualified. Okay, I call them overqualified. These girls who are overqualified, they are struggling to meet the right person. They are struggling to meet the right person. Because I just told you, if you look at the statistics, you know, 10 boys, 5 might achieve something. The other 5 might just be, you know, more hands-on, like we discussed earlier. They might be joiners, plumbers, okay, electricians. Someone might be an Amazon delivery driver. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing. Wallahi, there is nothing wrong with that. At least you're earning a halal living. You can put food on the table. You can fulfill your shari obligations. But she doesn't want that. She doesn't want to get married to an Amazon delivery driver. She, because deen is not being considered. She's not looking at the fact that, alhamdulillah, this person, he's got deen inside him. He has fear of Allah. This person will look after me. No matter what happens, this person will give me a happy and stable family and a happy and stable nikah. She doesn't look at that. And because of this, she finds it difficult to find a partner and she hits the age of 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 and she doesn't get married. And what happens after the age of who can tell me? After what age it becomes difficult for a girl to find a partner? Come on, tell me. The 30s. 30s, okay. Anybody else? Come on. I've got many experienced people sitting here. Mr. Wadi, come on. Give us something. I would say 30s as well. 30s. Get married at 28, 29. Okay. I was speaking yesterday to someone who does matchmaking in Preston. You probably know him. He frequents our sufa as well. And I had a good conversation with, with him regarding all these issues to get a better understanding. He said to me very clearly, after the age of 27, 27, okay, it becomes difficult. Because what you've got to appreciate is most boys would have got married by the age of 24, 25. That's the latest. 26, chalo chale. So this girl who's hit 27, hitting 28, the pool she has, you know, the pool of potential partners available to her has diminished, de is decreased sharply. She's now very limited, basically, in her choices. That's number one. And usually, you know, the good guys are going to get taken up. Let's just be honest. So in that sense as well, she's limited. And she's constantly looking for that person who's a high earner or at least on par with her. He's been taken as well. This person I was speaking to, he told me, okay, very sadly, you know, girls nowadays, they are looking at basically material, materialism. They're not looking at deen. And he said that if I have two boys on my list, one is, for example, a doctor, for argument's sake. The other is just a normal person. Normal job, normal job, average job. If this doctor was mentioned to four girls on the list, all four will want to see him. If this boy was mentioned out of four, one might want to see him. So this is the priority, basically, of our um, girls nowadays when it comes to nikah. And this is very dangerous because, you know, this person's earning potential, it could be affected in the future. It could be affected. There's no guarantee, even though he has that profession. You know, if you look just at the last four or five years inside this country, you know, COVID has changed so many things. It's changed so many things, basically. You know, they, money is something which comes and goes. What's the Arabic word for gold? Does anybody know? Any Arabic learners here? Come on. Zahab. Zahab. Zahab is gold. Zahab is from Zahaba. Zahaba in Arabic means to go. The nature of money is such it doesn't stay. It comes, it goes. We've got people living in Preston 30 years ago. They were millionaires. Today they've got nothing. 
30 years ago, they were multi-millionaires. They were owners of factories. They had 100 people working for them. Today, they've got nothing. Today, they are just a normal person. So money is something. Wealth is something which comes and it goes. And when there's no deen, what happens is that when the wealth goes, does that mean the nikah will go as well? The marriage is going to crumble as well? Inshallah, we'll continue with this discussion tomorrow. But the conclusion is, Rasulullah made it very clear. When you have different priorities, you need to give deen priority. Simple. If you give deen priority, you know, with other considerations, like I mentioned, that we don't deny that there's got to be physical attraction, etc. And remember what I said on the first or second day, the responsibility of being the breadwinner is the boy's responsibility. It's not the girl's responsibility. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to make deen a priority uh, for ourselves and for our children as well. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik.